Welcome to Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. I invite you to join me on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as a participant in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. This podcast is produced by Beautiful Teaching. Our goal is to immerse you into the beauty of good teaching with master teachers in classical education. We've just launched a list of new courses and book seminars which start this month. Some of our instructors are offering a few free courses too. Some of our courses include a book study on leisure, the basis of culture, immersion sessions such as mimetic approach to poetry, teaching history, and a seven-week foundations of a Charlotte Mason classical education with Karen Glass and a few of us on the team. For up-to-date course lists, you can visit us at beautifulteaching.coursestorm.com. That's beautifulteaching.coursestorm.com. Welcome back, Joshua Gibbs. Joshua Gibbs was on our podcast, uh, one of the very first episodes in season one. I think it might have been episode five. He spoke about, it was actually episode six, Teaching from a Spirit of Love, Helping Students Care. It was a lovely uh, interview. If you haven't listened to it, I encourage you to go back. But today, I have him here to talk with us about all things practical, which is very much at, the, at my heart. All of the professional development that I do and have done for seven or eight years has to do with the practical. What, how, how do we get into the nitty gritty of, okay, we understand what classical education is. Now, how do we do it, right? So I'm not exactly sure where Josh is going to take us with this topic of practical, because uh, as you know, he is very interesting and a, a interesting thinker and can be very provocative in his thoughts, which I love. So Josh, tell us what your thoughts are today. And let's just dive into a great conversation about all things practical. I love it. Well, first of all, thanks for having me back on the show. I love talking with you. I love talking about classical education. So deeply appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I've been thinking a lot about practicality for the last, well, I feel like it's been for years now, but especially over the last several months, um, because I'm putting on my own conference online this summer, um, Gibbs Classical Summer Online Conference, and I'm giving eight lectures, seven of which are, well, seven of which have titles that begin how to teach this or that book, how to teach the Divine Comedy, How to Teach Paradise Laws. Yep. Um, and I think that, uh, well, this is the second year for the conference. I think that one of the reasons why I started this conference was because I was disappointed at the lack of how-to lectures at summer conferences, uh, at, the, at the lack of practical advice at summer educators uh, or summer classical educators conferences. Um, I've found over the years, having been to all of them, having been to all of them many times, that there was this incredible number of, of conference titles or lecture titles like Towards a Flourishing Culture, uh, the word flourishing, the word culture kept coming up. And I would attend these lectures and they felt good to listen to. But then you walked away from them and two weeks later, you couldn't really remember what the conference or what the lecture was even about. And you remembered a kind of good feeling that you had, a kind of inspired feeling upon walking out, but there wasn't really anything to do. There was no, there was nothing practical. There was nothing eminent. It was all very big picture. And, and so I've been, you know, for the last several months writing these guides, you might say, on not a guide on Paradise Lost, not a guide on Pride and Prejudice, but a guide to teaching these books. You're so talking had... my language. I'm loving this already. This is what All I've right. been doing for seven or eight years, and I feel <laughs> the same way. And I'm telling you, like I said at the beginning of the show, yeah. teachers will say to me all the time, this is great. I love it. It's beautiful. I understand it. Now tell me how to teach it. And right. like the guides I wrote for the University of Dallas for Response yeah. to Ed, this is exactly what teachers need. Yeah. So true. Yeah. So true. Um, and I, 
you know, I've, I've certainly heard some very fine, impractical lectures before. I, I've heard some lectures that made me leave with this, um, you know, desire, <clears throat> excuse me, to go make myself a better teacher. Um, and that's obviously very valuable, but, um, but you can't have an entire conference stuffed with nothing but lectures that make you feel good. Um, you've got to have, you've got to give people some things to do when they walk away. And so that's really, that's really where, um, my interests are at the moment. Exactly. Pedagogy. Yes. That's what this is. It's pedagogy. Yes. It really is. We hear philosophy. We hear about this curriculum, that curriculum, but we don't hear a lot about pedagogy, good teaching. What does it actually look like? I can't tell you how many teachers have emailed me when I worked at the University of Dallas, when I worked at Responsive Ed, and even at the current school I work for that say, okay, I really like, so the next step after they hear what I say, this is how you do it. I model it. We do it together. Mm -hmm. We do a lesson together. Then they say, I really like this, but now I need a video like of a classroom mm -hmm. where they're actually doing this so I can actually really see. And that's another big project that I would love to do, like videos of classroom instruction that actually looks like this. Um, I was just thinking through my, my classical education podcast.com website and I have my podcast goals listed. I have four of them, virtue, beauty, pedagogy, and art. Mm -hmm. And under pedagogy, I have Encouraging educators in the practical implementation of a classical pedagogy. So I, it's, I, I can't believe it's been this long. Like I should have had you talking about this a year ago because <laughs> my podcast, one of the goals is let's talk about practical implementation. And I try to get a lot of our guests yeah. to go that direction. And it's a struggle sometimes. And I love all the guests I've had. And they've said, you know, wonderful, amazing things. But diving into the practical on the podcast, sometimes I feel like I'm pulling teeth. Yeah. <laughs> and But it's so important. That's what parents need. That's what teachers need. And your new, um, you call it a pamphlet, I guess, called A Short sure. Introduction to Classical Christian Education. As I'm reading through this, there are lots of little paragraphs that you say. I want to quote one of them that just bring us right back into this. You say, as a movement... Classical Christian education is not without its problems, and one of its greatest problems over the last 30 years has been its strong reliance on theory as opposed to experience or common sense. So expand on that. Yeah. Um, well, I think that this is an ongoing problem. Well, let me state that up. And I think that one of the reasons why this is an ongoing problem is because so many of the movers and shakers in classical education are headmasters, college props, bloggers, as opposed to teachers. Like very few teachers have a big platform, which means that very few people who are in the trenches are explaining life in the trenches to other people in the trenches. The trenches are often being explained by people that are standing up on the edge looking down who haven't set foot in the trench in 10 or 20 years. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, um, that there's no theorist or blogger out there uh, who's worth listening to. That's not at all what I'm saying. But I am saying that I think that more teachers in classical education need bigger platforms and that teachers need to learn from teachers. Um, and that if you're a if you're a kindergarten teacher, you need to learn from a veteran kindergarten teacher. Yes, exactly. If you're a kindergarten teacher, do not listen to a college professor who has no experience teaching kindergarten. Thank uh, you. <laughs> if, you're, if you teach high school philosophy uh, or high school literature, there should be a high school literature teacher out there, a veteran who's been doing it for 10, 20, 30 years, right. who tells you how to do it. So um, that's, the, that's the kind of experience. When I, when, I, when I say that there's this need for experience, uh, I mean that the teachers need instruction from people who have been there, uh, not from people who have read books by those who have been there, uh, but but you need someone that you can imitate. And and the, right. the fact of the matter is, is that a kindergarten teacher can't imitate a college prof. Doesn't That's work exactly that way. That's exactly true. That's exactly true. I remember when I was working at the University of Dallas and we were starting our uh, pilot program with five schools uh, launching this humanities curriculum we were writing. And my primary experience where, I mean, I'm 
I'm pretty good at all of pre-K through eighth grade, especially, but my, like, my favorite part is probably between fourth and eighth grade. That's where I feel real comfortable teaching, going into the classroom. And we would get all these emails from the teachers at the schools that needed support for K2. Mm-hmm. And myself and my two other people on my team, none of us had K2 experience. And I kept I kept saying, we need budget so we can hire another person to be on our team that's K2 because I refused. I actually refused to help them because I, I knew that the practical they needed, I was not qualified. And I won't – I feel more qualified now because I've been working in a school and working with the K2 teachers and going sure. into the classroom a lot more. But when I was at the University of Dallas, I didn't feel qualified. And I, it's been, I homeschooled my kids, but I actually didn't homeschool them in kindergarten and second grade. I put them in school. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I, I feel, I, feel, I agree with you. And I, and I, uh, I think that they really do desperately need, need that help. And all of the consultants I have that work for me are classroom teachers. Yeah. And they all, most of them actually are teaching in the classroom still today, which is challenging when I'm trying to, set them up for professional development because I'm like, I have a school that wants to have some professional development on this day, but then they're also in professional development that right. school, you know? Yes. So we've been working through the schedules and trying to figure that out this year. But uh, yeah, classroom teachers need to be the ones. I agree with you. You've got to have experience in this. And yeah. I, th- I think you're right that that is one of the big problems. Yeah. And I, th- I think that this is, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you've, how familiar you are with the world of the world of professional sports, but you often find that um, kind of average former pros turn into great coaches. Um, you mm-hmm. find that, that that people with experience, like players with experience, uh, are just far easier to listen to as a coach than someone who's never had any kind of playing experience. Um, and I, I think the same is. The same thing is true just across the board, no matter what kind of of discipline you're talking about. You want to listen to somebody who knows what you've been through. Um, You want someone who can sympathize with your weakness uh, and can give you encouragement in your weakness, Um, as as opposed to either flattery, which often happens when you're getting advice from somebody who who doesn't have experience, um, or standards that are far beyond what any person in your uh, in your position can actually uh, hope to deliver on uh, so flattery or impossible standards is often what you get when the leader is not somebody who has much experience mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what are some of the common questions that you've come across from teachers um you mean like when i'm when I'm doing consulting work or, or just in general, uh, like that, that are practical questions. Like, do you, I mean, are you getting uh, these a lot? Like, yeah. Yeah. So I would say that the, well, the kind of questions that I get greatly depend on whether someone has read my work or not read my work. So in my work, I've tried to address many of the most common questions that teachers have and, and questions that I've been asked. Uh, as a literature teacher, as somebody who opens up an old book at the start of class every day and, and is responsible for teaching it. So, you know, some of those questions would be like, uh, do you do all the reading yourself? Do the students do reading? Do they do the reading at home? Do you do it in class? Do they do it in class? Does everybody get a turn with it? Uh, and, there's... And, and, the, and the, the million dollar question that is, how do I grade it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> questions about grading and assessment. Um how do we uh, how do we grade? How do we how do we assess in the era of Chat GPT? How are we sending students home with papers to write when there's AI programs that'll write the paper for you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that those are those kind of basic questions, the questions that you have to have to deal with on your first day of teaching. Um, uh, questions about discipline, questions about classroom management. Um, uh, what's a What's a range of grades that you do? How do you grade an essay? What's a what's a possible score on an essay? Can a student get a 5% on an essay? Can they get a 6%? What's the difference between a 5 and a 6% on an essay? Uh, at what point do you have a student rewrite something? When do you allow a student to rewrite right. something? If a, if a student 
tries very hard and fails, do you let them rewrite? If they don't try at all, do you let them rewrite it? Um, you know, questions that sort of um, sit on the at the boundary between what's uh, dealing with behavior and discipline versus assessment. And there's often a kind of gray area between what's a grading issue versus what's a what's a discipline issue. So yeah, I, I think that those are some of the most the most common questions that mm -hmm. I've received over the last five years or so. Mm -hmm. We should just write a book with like an answer, like all those the questions and just answer yeah. them. Like <laughs> yes. Oh well, that's a great idea. Someone <laughs> should do that. We should do this together because okay. this is. I, I would. I would love to work on a project like this. It's practical. I like giving yeah. the practical. I, it's needed, and I, I'm trying to give everybody the what I wished I had had when I started homeschooling. You know, yeah. I didn't have the internet. I didn't have these things. I used Charlotte Mason Ambleson online, which is very like it kind of loosey goosey in a way. Cause there's no, like, this is how much you read every day. And this is what you do every day. And, and you have to understand Charlotte Mason's philosophy, which in her philosophy of education, the pedagogy is all laid out, mm -hmm. but it's so different than what we're used to that it takes a long time to get used to it. And so over the course of many, many years, I started to really understand, oh, and I started to understand what this could look like in a classroom. And my mind started to put this mm -hmm. together of, oh, this is what it would look like in a classroom. And then I got hired to go do this in a classroom and it really works. Mm -hmm. And it's very freeing mm -hmm. for the teacher as well. It's a beautiful pedagogy. This is why K-8 is kind of my my field here. Yeah, <laughs> but, okay. um, but, you know, she does lay out how to do it in a classroom, but you don't feel the confidence to do it. You feel like I need to make, like, am I really doing this right? And this is what I do love about teachers who are asking these questions. And I'm so glad we're getting these practical questions because what it means is that they care. It means that they really want to embrace this classical theory that they've been hearing and learning about. And they know it's different. So they want to, like, well, then how do I make grading humane? Mm -hmm. Right? So they're asking these questions because they actually do care and they want to do the right thing. Yes, that's great. Yeah. The, yeah. the more people are asking for practical advice, the better. The less yeah. theory, the better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the theory is super important, but I think that, yeah, like you said, I, and this is a, a common problem. How, how do we fix this problem, Josh? How do we address it? It is a, it's a systemic problem. And, and, and it's almost like the pendulum is all the way over on this theory side, and we need to just kind of bring it back so that there's a balance. And I yeah. think some of the conferences are starting to do that. I'm starting mm -hmm. to see some of the conferences are bringing in classroom teachers. I'm not, right. I've gone to some of them and I don't necessarily think some of the classroom teachers are still doing it really the best they could be. Mm -hmm. But I think some of the conferences are trying uh, to do that. But but what are your thoughts on how to, how to fix this and how to bring a solution to it? I wrote an article for Circe a couple months ago suggesting that summer conference uh, the people that put on summer conferences need to put classroom teachers on the big stage as opposed to only giving them breakout yes. sessions. Thank I you for reminding it. me. I did <laughs> read that. That's great. You're right. I would love to see one fourth grade teacher from Kansas speaking in front of the entire ACCS audience. Amen. <laughs> All I <laughs> agree with you. Instead of everybody that has a PhD. Right. Or, yes. yeah, just people that have big platforms. Give a, give a big platform to somebody from a small, from a small school, let, um, and I'm not saying like throw quality control out. I mean, vet the person you're putting up there and don't pick somebody just because they teach fourth grade, but there's countless great fourth grade teachers out there that have been teaching yes. for 25 years and they could help everyone out by giving some, because here's the thing, here's the thing. If you put some fourth grade teacher from Kansas up on the stage, they are not going to give a theoretical talk. They're going to talk about what they know. They're going to talk about what they yes. experienced. And if and if you and if you gave them the freedom to do that, uh, I, th I think it would be immensely valuable for everybody. I it would agree. Be, it would be valuable for the sophomore humanities teachers and the senior chemistry teachers to see a fourth grade a fourth grade teacher from Kansas that you've never heard of before who knows how to do their job put up there and address everybody. 
I mean, I've already, I observe teachers all the time. So I already got a list of names that if anybody from these major conferences want a list of names, they can call me. I've had a, um, I had a narration in the classroom virtue or panel on my podcast a few months ago of four fantastic teachers from that I've watched. They're great. They would be great as presenters. Robin Johnston, who I worked with at the University of Dallas, was a middle school teacher for 25 years, and she's extremely practical. Probably Mm. one of the most practical teacher trainers I've ever met in my life. I've learned a ton from her. She would be great up on the stage. Robin would do it to me. Just call University of Dallas and get Robin Johnston. Like any of the, I would love to see her on the stage. She deserves it. (laughs) Yes. She would be great. So yeah, I agree. That is a, a really good solution so yeah for starters i mean it's a, it's a beginning but i think it'd be a that's a strong beginning to the yeah <laughs> to the problem of too much theory not enough experience yeah yeah what other things do you want to go down this rabbit trail on practical i, I could pull out some more uh yeah th- parts in your essay if you want me to read a few more things you've said what else stood out to you okay one um let's see this is practical. It, it, in your in your a short introduction to classical Christian education, yep. you say it is worth noting that both of these explanations of classical Christian education, ages and stages, how to think. This was all Dorothy Sayers. Yeah, have have always been more popular among headmasters, school boards, consultants, and admission officers than they have been among teachers. I yep. think what you were getting at here is the when you actually try to do the practical implementation of the Sarazian trivium. Yeah. It actually doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. That's you right. want to expand on that? Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. <laughs> sure. It, it, yeah. <laughs> um, it, so, uh, okay. Let me, let me give one, I have one little caveat on this, but you know, before launching into this, um, and that's that, uh, I used Dorothy Sayers, translation of the divine comedy for years and i think that dorothy sayers notes on the divine comedy are the greatest work of literary criticism of the 20th century i think dorothy sayers is or was a genius yes um i don't think her theory of education is very good uh i i think that she had an amazing output um, I'm very glad uh, that she lived. I think she's a she's a wonderful asset to the church. But um, but the theory of stages that she came up with strikes me as being very much of a piece with every other 20th century right. educational theorist. And and she herself in Lost Tools admits that her idea is not particularly. Uh, orthodox. It's not vetted. It's not old. It's her own. Um, and and I think on top of that, that it's her own. It's based on very limited experience. And it was a reflection on her own self, um, which, which is fine. But Dorothy Sayers was an exceptional intellectual, which means that you can't pattern uh, a model of education off of one of the great intellects of the 20th century. You can't assume that everyone can do what she did or that everyone has her path to follow. And I'm not saying we lower the standard because not everybody's as smart as Dorothy Sayers. Um, I mean that uh, the whole the whole theory of the rhetoric stage and what rhetoric stage students want and what kind of work is appropriate to them, I would say is true of about 5% of my students. I would say that around 5% of my students meet or or their lives and their abilities and their proclivities correspond with the rhetoric-minded student or the rhetoric stage student. It's not that these students don't exist. It's that they're not, they're not the main. They're not the average. Um, and and you, you simply can't design a successful school off of the experience of Five percent of your students. You have to be more common than that. You have to be more more average than that. Yeah, I love what you said in this. You said something about how okay, while juniors and seniors have a wider experience of the world than fourth or fifth graders, they still learn in the same way for the most part. Yeah, they're all basically part of the same quote stage. 
a yeah. hungry, thirsty stage in which they readily absorb everything they are regu reg regularly exposed to and recapitulate it in a simple, unedited sort of way. That I, I put a big yeah. heart on that. I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's, it, you're you're a hundred percent right. I have found that to be very true in yeah. my work with schools. That I'm sorry, but second graders are also able to do logic and rhetoric, not at the wow. higher level, but they're yep. still, their brain is processing things through a, if you want to do a sort of segment in the brain, mm -hmm. we have a grammar, a logic, dialectic, rhetoric, rhetorical part of the way we think, the way we communicate, the way we operate as people. And so to sort of just focus in on one and not tap into the others is actually not a humane education. I agree. Totally. And, and that's why it doesn't work. <laughs> and um, I'm curious, what do you think was her motivation for that? I, like, I wish we had a recording of her because it was a, originally yeah. a, a talk, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll wonder, like, she was brilliant intellectual like you. And I'm almost like, do you think maybe she was trying to be provocative like you do mm -hmm. in, in some of your talks? Maybe just trying to engage a conversation about education and get people talking? It could have been. I, I think that, um, well, there's, uh, there's no telling what of a what of an intellectual's output they're ultimately going to be known for and most deeply held responsible for after their This dead. is what she wanted to be known for. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, if, uh, you know, it, should any of my work survive my death, I, I'd probably be chagrined to find out, you know, 100 years from now, <laughs> not, not true, 50 years from now, what, what ended up, what people ended up caring, <laughs> you, you know, caring about and how they interpreted it. Um, uh, Peter Lightheart has a great, several great chapters on that phenomenon in his book *Deep Exegesis* and and the uncontrollableness of of a text outside the the life of the author. Um, but I, was she trying to be provocative? Maybe she's certainly trying to uh, she certainly tried to simplify things, and and yeah. simplifying things is a very effective way of being provocative. Um, I, I think simplifying things is maybe the ultimate way of being provocative is to is boiling things down to a kind of simple choice. Um, and it's and it's especially provocative in the in the 21st century when so many people think that it's a mark of your sophisticated and enlightened wit that, that you refuse to make choices. Why can't it be both? It should be both. Why not both? Uh, and, and that often passes as wisdom these days. The person who's like, why can't it be both? As though no difficult decision actually has to be made. So well, maybe, I mean, I mean, maybe she's making a, a, yeah, a I'm radical wondering, simplification. Because the end of her essay was pretty good. I'm mm -hmm. trying to remember how it ended, but it was a pretty good challenge about self-learning, mm -hmm. like becoming self-learners. I think, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's right. It just, it just, I have had that question in my mind, though, wondering, is she trying, who is her audience? Was she trying to be provocative? Mm. Was she just trying to get them to intellectually engage in some kind of discussion about what education should look like in order to get kids to become self-learners and right. motivated to learn? I don't know. But it reminds me a little bit like what you just said about simplifying it, yeah. where I just read your, um, I don't know if you want to call it an essay article um, on the girl's parent, the parent who came into the office yeah. and said the daughter was writing an essay to convince the classroom on why you should commit suicide. Right. And the or whole why point it was allowable. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and the whole point of it was <laughs> that, the, the, but what we don't teach students how to think, or we only teach them how to think, not what to think. And you address right. that also in this brochure. But that to me is sort of like that essay was sort of a simplified way of Right. Being very provocative to get me yeah. thinking, and it kept me engaged in reading, and it was a great point. I had, I had never thought of it. So one of the things I appreciate about you is you do that. You simplify something down. Yeah. You engage us with a real provocative and interesting angle of looking at something <laughs> that makes us go, hmm, where's he going with this? I appreciate and, that. You, yeah. you have correctly identified my MO. That is what I tried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let me see. What else did I highlight that was practical in here? A couple of things. Okay, you say the tendency in classical Christian education to rely more heavily on theory than experience derives from the fact that many of the movers and shakers of the movement aren't teachers. You already said this. They're headmasters, consultants, college professors, or bloggers with little or no experience teaching. And we already talked about that. Okay. And then you you kind of talked about how important it is for students 
to be connected to their own experiences as well in their learning that they need to be experiencing, right. which is also very practical. Yeah, given that, okay, so it might be a fun thing to talk about given that the school year is coming up on its uh, on its close. Um, talking about how students ought to spend their summer vacation. Um, so that that point in the um, that point in the in the pamphlet uh, is is connected to this thing that I've 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 realized more and more about my students maybe just in the last four or five years, it took me a long time to realize this, um, which is that a lot, of the, a lot of the big conversations that you have when you're teaching Paradise Lost and Pride and Prejudice and Jane Eyre and, and these sorts of books, a lot of these books are about experiences that the average high school student hasn't had yet. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that they're, they're too young for them. Uh, to, for the books, I mean, uh, because a lot of what you're doing in high school is saving up a knowledge of experiences that you will have later on. And, That's and a that, good point. That yeah. later on, you will have the experiences that have been described to you for years, and you'll have this way of interpreting them and understanding them. Your first heartbreak, you know, betrayal by someone that you're very close to, the death of a parent, the death of a grandparent. Um, you know, a lot of high school students have not experienced these things yet, or they're just on the cusp of experiencing them. Um, and so, you know, when you're teaching Pride and Prejudice or you're teaching uh, Jane Eyre, like the students are aware of these kinds of experiences that lie ahead of them. And they're already trying to interpret their lives as best they can in the light of the claims of the book, even though they know that they're often stretching it, that they haven't had Jane Eyre's heartbreak over Rochester, but they have had a crush on someone. And, uh, you know, it was yes. it was painful to be shut down by them. So it's not really the heartbreak of someone like like Jane Eyre, but it's but it approximates it to some extent. Um, so so I bring all of this up. Uh, in in reference to the summer, because um, I, I often tell students when summer comes up, um, like you should you should read something over the summer, but you got to do something other than read so that you know what the people that write the books are writing about. Like you have to do the things that are explained in classic literature in order for classic literature to even really matter. Otherwise, it's just this kind of empty description of a reality that you'll that you never touch, and it's not. To be honest, it's not really of value to you. Learning how to handle heartbreak is worthless if you never get your heart broken. Uh, learning how to handle these things, which is often what classic literature is doing, uh, explaining the human experience, is worthless if you don't have the human experience. So, you know, read some good books over the summer, but, you know, go get your heart broken, too. Go do all of the things that classic literature is about so that there's some point in in reading it next year. Mm -hmm. That's a piece of advice I often give students. Yeah, yeah, yeah those things will happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny that you bring up Jane Eyre. Uh, that is the book. So I hated reading until I read Jane Eyre. And I was no kidding. Grade. Yeah. No. And remember, on our last podcast I interviewed you, you said 10th grade is the magic year. That's when you know yeah. where you're going in life, right? Yeah, that's right. And I love that because uh, that's what happened to me. 10th grade was the year I read Jane Eyre. Uh, uh -huh. And I loved the book. Yeah. I am now 52. So I was 15 when I read that. Yeah. I just reread Jane Eyre for the first time a few months ago. Okay. How did it go? And it like? I bald. <laughs> I bawled my way through it. And what I was able to do was rem what I, okay. I didn't remember the story so much, like the details and stuff. I knew the gist of the story. I didn't remember much of the detail, but when I read it, it transported me emotionally to how it impacted me as a, as a 15 year old. Mm -hmm. And I, and I realize now that the way it impacted me was in my faith and in my choices mm. with relationships with guys. Yeah. I made the choice to be pure in my 
in in my you know to be chased with my relationships with guys because of that book it's not a book about being chased or you know virginity or any of that but it impacted me that i wanted to emulate you know that the the chaste choices she made right you know because she didn't want to marry him just to marry him. She wanted it to be for the right reason, right? right. She wasn't going to just live with him because there was a point in the book where... Oh, yeah, chapter 27. He, yeah, where he I wanted her to... He's like, well, like, well we can it. just live together and we don't right. have to actually legally be married where he was begging her, right? Right. But she knew that was wrong. And so yeah. that was... So that impacted me in yeah. the decisions of, of being chased. But it also had a huge impact in my faith in God and the journey, her spiritual journey yeah. of forgiveness, her spiritual journey of healing from all of the abuse that she had had right. and from seeing the best in people and even her choices in being cautious with how much to share with a stranger, you know, like, mm-hmm. y- you know, all of that, I know now had a profound impact on the choices I made moving forward. Mm. And it is the book that it is the book that made me decide to love literature. Mm. That's fantastic. I, it's so easy for me to believe that like that's um, it, it, it seems a book seems a book that was it's just ideal for your high school years yeah um, it really is yes it, i i so wish that this book had been on the table for me back when i was in high school i wish that i'd had a, a chance to read it i um i i read the book for the first time to teach it for a class like i had no experience with it i had never picked it up for its own sake i had to teach it so i read it and i read it over a summer um as I was preparing to teach it the following year. Um, and I, I mean, I had an experience with that book that was, okay, so side story here. I had an experience with that book that I have never had with any other book. Um, I had a somewhat alarming experience with that book. So I had a copy of it and I... a a physical copy of it, but I also had an audio version of it. And when I would go for a long walk, I would listen to some chapters and then I'd come back and I'd read it. And then I'm, and I'm kind of toggling back and forth. I do this with a lot of books. Um, That's what I do too. Do you do that too? (laughs) Okay. Yeah. I I, I find it it very, I I find it very satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. So so, uh, this this is eight years ago now. This is eight years ago that I read it for the first time. And I took a long walk, and I was probably, this was, uh, I don't know, 14, chapter 14, 15, 16, somewhere around there. It's maybe like two chapters after she shows up, after she leaves Lowood and goes to Thornfield, and she's she's kind of commenting on it. And I was taking, I was taking a walk, and I was more... This is going to sound goofy, but I was more zoned in to this audiobook experience than I have ever been with anything that anyone has ever read ever before. Um, and and like it was one of those timeless states where where you're you're walking around, but but all of a sudden you find yourself in a place that you've like, <laughs> how did I get here? Oh my goodness! I'm like. I'm wondering if it was the same audiobook I have because I was immersed in the audiobook too. I couldn't, I was like, I would just sit, I, I never just sit on the couch and listen to an audiobook yes. ever. Yes. Yeah, but I'm this always one, doing something else. Yes, but this one was just like, I can't do there. I spent one whole entire day to get through the rest of the book because I couldn't put it down. Yeah. I just sat on my couch the entire day in my pajamas. Yes, finish, listening to it. To finish it because I couldn't, I'm trying to find which version I had and in my, um, I'll find, you keep talking. Keep talking. I'm gonna have to go back I'll and find it. see if I can find the, the version I was listening to. Um, but it's so for anyone who happens to have not read the haven't re- hasn't read this book, Jane Eyre is written in the first person, which is which is important, uh, I think, to the to the experience that I had. So I'm I'm listening to this book, and there was a there was a portion of the book that was probably three. 
paragraphs long. It was a very short portion of this book where she was, where Jane is making some comment on the nature of goodness or happiness. She's commenting on the goodness, the boring goodness of the people that work at Thornfield. It, that's, that was the, it's around that, that place. And for about three paragraphs, um, I lost every sense that I was hearing a story being read. And, and it was as though a flesh and blood human being was yes. talking to me. And yes. I, I will say that has never happened to me before. And when it, when it was over, I was a little shaken by it. Like I felt like there right. was some ghost in the machine that had, like I was looking at a painting that winked at me uh, and I like take a step back. Like, did, yeah. did that just happen? Did was was that a real smile on the face of that on the face of that woman in the portrait? Um, but the there's there's no other book that this has ever happened with, and and I I mean I think that this is because this um, this character is so profoundly drawn. Jane Eyre is this entirely plausible. Um, sharply drawn, carefully nuanced, paradoxical, yeah, real person, and and yes. I think that there's um, uh, I think outside of the, the the only person, the only author that I could possibly compare, like Bronte with, is uh, Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky had this unique gift for truly liberating his characters like Dostoevsky created his characters and then freed them to do what they wanted to do and and he may have been writing the words on the page but he was only recording what these what these um yeah. living marble statues like like, like this the marble statue yes. of Dostoevsky's character Hook on real flesh and start walking around. And he was the creator, but he wasn't controlling everything. It's almost like how we would think what God's doing with us. Absolutely. <laughs> That's the only analog to it. That's the only analog to it is that, is that God bestows uh, this life God, the, and then, the nature and then yeah. the nature, the nature of the gift of human personhood is this autonomy and freedom. And, and, the being of God holds the cosmos together where he to withdraw his breath, it would all disappear. Nonetheless, he has, he has allowed us. Um, uh, he has given us ourselves, right? Like Aslan says to all, yes. all of the creatures after the creation, like, Creature, I give you yourselves. Uh, that's, that's a great description of the autonomy and freedom that, that God has given, uh, has given us. Um, and, and the, you know, the righteous man like gives it back. Like, it, you know, you give, um, you, thine own of thine own, you give the, the being that God has given you back to him. And that's, that's the only real gift that you have to give God is the gift of your own personhood. Um, but, but I, I think that Bronte was able to do this, this unique act of creation where she had this truly free, truly like it, Jane Eyre comes to life. Yes. She's a real person in this way yes. that very few <laughs> characters in novels ever are. It's true. I, I'm going to put in the show notes the audiobook that I listen to. If you okay. figure out which one yours is, I'm hoping it's okay. the same. Mine is a audible, only from Audible. It has that little that little yellow bar that says only yep. from Audible. And it was narrated by Juliet Stevenson. It okay. was fantastic. Uh I'd be curious if yours is different. I'll probably listen to yours to, uh, just okay. to, to get another narrator. But yeah, I think you're right. And um, it almost makes me wonder, like with Dostoevsky especially, if he really wasn't even sure where he was going with his characters. Like while yes. he was writing, he was just writing and, like you said, letting it unfold. And he wasn't really sure yeah. where he was going with it. Right. Just letting the pen do its do right. thing. <laughs> or he or he magic. simply has this this kind of goal in mind. Yeah. And he he lets the characters move until they arrive at this goal or or he creates the yeah. characters so that they will move towards this goal 
and he knows how it ends, but he doesn't, but he hasn't determined every last thing that happens in the meanwhile. Yeah. He, his intentions are not expressed in terms of like a chronological list of things that have to happen. Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's not a plan that he has like with items on it. First I'll do this, then I'll do that. So I want to tie in our idea of practical and experience that we're yeah. with, with these books and teaching literature. So, yeah. so we, we think about how we're giving them these books with experiences that they haven't experienced yet. Right. Pre experiences, right? Yeah. And then we're doing the practical thing as a teacher, we're teaching this book, right? So how do we help students practically in the classroom experience a pre-experience? Mm. Sort of experience yes. the book as it is. The yeah. wonder and the beauty and the goodness and the truth that's unfolding out of this book. How do we set up the right atmosphere for that experience? Yeah. Um, so two things come to mind. Two things come to mind. The first is you make these distant experiences that they'll someday have as near to them as possible by way of analogy. So you 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 deal with whatever the average, like I teach sophomores, you deal with what the average sophomore has dealt with. And you and you choose the sorts of experiences that they've had that most closely approximate these these kind of bigger experiences. And you you try to draw a connection between um the proper emotional response to something that they've experienced with the proper emotional response to something that they haven't experienced yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I, in teaching Jane Eyre, in teaching uh, Pride and Prejudice, in teaching Paradise Lost, um, romance is, is a subject that comes up often enough. Um, uh, I spend the lion's share of my time in Paradise Lost on Adam and Eve, on books eight and nine of Paradise Lost. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot in there about, in, in all of those books, about the difficulties of marriage, um, the trials of marriage, the kind of suffering inherent in marriage, also the consolations of marriage, why marriage is wonderful, what marriage is good for, what kind of very practical problems marriage solves, uh, as well as the kind of practical problems that have to be overcome in the midst of a marriage. Um, and so uh, some of it, um, so some of it's like drawing analogies out. Uh, to whatever is the closest thing to romance that a high school student has experienced, and sometimes it's mere, sometimes it's mere affection. Uh, sometimes it's just a longing in their own heart. But the longing in a teenage heart often plays out in these, uh, you know, fantasies of what you'd like to happen. I don't mean anything mm -hmm, perverse. Mm -hmm. I, I right. simply mean like when you start wondering, like, what would it be like to live with that person? You know, you, mm -hmm. you have feelings for someone and, and um, you know, when you're daydreaming, you're wondering what it would be like to spend your life with that person. And and you even talk with, uh, you know, your friends about the people that you have a crush on or the people that you like. And um, and you pay attention to the little little romances that uh, grow up in your friends, you know, that the, 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 your your friends have boyfriends and girlfriends and. And you hear them talk about these things and you wonder what it would be like if you were in a in a romance. So I try to bring up all those kinds of things when I'm teaching a book that's about romance or I'm teaching a book about marriage. And I, I try to make the far offness of marriage seem a little closer by reasoning through analogy as often as I possibly can. Um, and that's a that's a big part of it. But um, the, the other thing is, so there's reasoning by analogy, but there's also... Like, uh, just take the, the practical example of Pride and Prejudice, a book about marriage. How do you talk about marriage with a bunch of single people that are 15? Um, I, I think uh, it's very helpful when you're teaching a book like Pride and Prejudice to, to open up with, um, you know, with a lesson on what the book is about. Like, this is a book about marriage. And to tell students... You are at the age where you've got to start thinking about this. You're not too young at 16 to start thinking about what kind of person you'd like to marry and right. what kind of person you're going to have to become to get that kind of person to marry you. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's true. It's, it's one thing to say, I want to, I want to marry somebody who's good and kind and pious and faithful and beautiful and all the rest. 
But then you also have to ask, why would that person want to marry me? Right. Um, and, and are you making any kind of effort to become the kind of person that the person that you want to marry would want to spend the rest of their life with? Or is this all just this kind of like pipe dream where you're like, well, it'd be nice to marry a really kind, generous, faithful person. Uh -huh. um, sure hope that happens. Not going to lift a finger to, to move in that direction. So I, I you know, I ask students to, um, to treat pride and prejudice as time and space to contemplate and to decide and know for themselves who they ought to want to marry, to, to begin thinking about the kind of person that would not only make a good companion, but would make a good mother. Um, and, and I invite them as they're reading the book to consider um, which of these young women is going to become the best mother at the end. Uh, you know, by the end, it's not just who's going to make the best companion for a man or what man's going to make the best companion for a woman. Like when you choose a spouse, you're choosing a, a, the, the mother or father of your children. Mm -hmm. um, and so you ought to be thinking about what kind of woman you want to raise your children. You ought to be thinking about what kind of man you want to, to raise your children. Um, and so there's a, there's like a planning aspect to it. Um, and so reasoning by analogy and, and making plans, plans for the future. I think that's a big part of um, the pre-experience, really, as you put it. So this reasoning by analogy idea, I feel like if I'm remembering correctly in the movie Freedom Riders with, mm -hmm. was it Hillary Swank? I didn't see it. it. Yeah. I think that's what she did. She worked, it's a true, it's based on a true story and she's working with a bunch of inner city kids. Yeah. And the principal uh, basically won't, they have all these books, like they've got Anne Frank in the closet. Mm -hmm. They won't give the books to the kids because they think they'll just ruin the books. They won't. It's it's a very powerful movie. I'm mm. surprised you haven't seen it with all the movies you talk about. Uh, and and she sort of did this where she she brought in the story of Anne Frank to these high school kids who are all literally some of the kids die because they're in gangs. Mm. And so she's bringing in sort of that relevancy of experience right. in their culture. So it's interesting from a from a classical school perspective in doing this we you know we may have some some classical schools that are title one and and have you know a lot of i know of one in in mesquite texas that most like more than half of the students english is their second language wow yeah. and so they're dealing with students who are they're they're, they're reading shakespeare they're doing it but they're mm -hmm. approaching it in the way that you're saying to approach it and they're helping the students to experience it right. even though they have the language barrier and it's actually working and they're doing a great job so from a teacher perspective you also have to understand the culture of your school mm -hmm. and the student body you're working with in order to help them have the experience of the literature in 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 the right way for them yeah. and and i i would say being really careful um with how you're treating the story in the literature, not to overanalyze it. Well, like I always bring this up. It's not the first time I've said this on a podcast, the the poem by Billy Collins on intro, introduction to poetry, where he says, the teachers want to tie it to a chair and beat it. You know, it's like a hose, you know, and we do this with literature, literature professors, teachers, uh, you know, struggle because they, they want to tie the the story to a chair <laughs> right. and, and, and uh, what is it? Pull a confession out of it, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Trying to overanalyze it. And I, I would think that that's probably also something that you do from a practical perspective is you make sure that they're experiencing the beauty of the book for the book. Yeah. Without I trying just, to beat a confession out of it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yeah. To, to, to have some confidence in the literature. Mm -hmm. Um to do more of the heavy lifting than the teacher is doing. Like the, right. the, that a great piece of literature is not just a series of talking points for the teacher. Right. Like the, like the book is the point of the class and, and the teacher has to make way for the book and he has to present it and he has to shine a light on it. Um, but, but a classic literature class is about classic literature. It's not a book club where we all share our opinions on it. Like the, the book is the teacher and the teacher makes room for the book and and glorifies the book and you know explains the book sure um and preaches you, the book 
Can you think of any kind of really good questions that you've developed when you were teaching either Jane Eyre or Pride and Prejudice in a book, dis in a class discussion? Like what kind of question would you ask the student in the middle of the book? I, I don't have, uh, so, so Jane Eyre, chapter 27, mm -hmm. I have my students read Jane Eyre over the summer. It's a summer reading book. And then we open the year with close to two weeks of discussion of, about the book. And I, whenever I, whenever I do this, I center my, my conversations on the book on three key conversations. One is a conversation that Jane has with Helen Burns about revenge in chapter nine. The other is when Rochester tries to convince Jane to stay and be his mistress in chapter 27. And then St. John's lame proposal at the end of the book that Jane rejects. Um, those are the those are the three places where where we spend a lot of time, like like go through chapter nine, chapter twenty seven, and I forget which one it is, the St. John's proposal. But we kind of like it's kind of a grueling deep dive into this. Where like I read a line, and I don't have an amazing question. My question is, why did he say that? Like, what right. what's his plan here? What's he? Why would he say that? What's behind this? Um, so this, uh, you know, there's there's very few. I would say there's very few big like amazing philosophical questions. Like a lot of the questions that I ask when I'm teaching Jane Eyre is, what's that mean? Why do you say that? Um, what's he trying to do here? What's his plan? Is it working? Um, and it's it's really the same kind of questions that that everybody asks when they're in a fierce conversation with somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're trying to figure out what somebody's what their point is and what they're not saying, and and you're um, uh, you're trying to figure out um, uh, I don't know what why they're picking particular words when they talk with you and why they're why they're putting emphasis on 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 certain things that they say and not on others and and that's a lot of what I do when I read chapter twenty seven really slowly with. Um, with my students is it's uh, I mean it's a little bit like a chess match between James okay so and so they've read it at home and then yeah. you're taking them into 27 and in the yeah. class are you actually yeah. just kind of reading it out loud and then yep. stopping every now and then going oh wait why did he do that yep so this is your yeah, practical so, advice to teachers yes <laughs> um so that's uh absolutely yeah I think yeah I love I, it I Jane Eyre is the only book that students read at home I read all the rest of the books out loud in class slowly with the students day by do day. Do you by have day. them narrate? Do you have them tell back? Uh yes I do. Uh I have them yeah I mean they're they're talking, they're speaking and I often have them um I recently I've I've started having these lessons where the students don't even have their books out. They simply listen to me read uh for maybe 20 or 30 minutes and then write it write a short synopsis of what they heard. Uh, and it's a, a written narration, pretty much. Yeah, it's, that's your that that's a basic like third or fourth grade assignment right there. Mm -hmm, Works mm -hmm. great in high school too. Yes, it there does. There's no need to jettison that assignment simply because a student went from elementary school exactly into seventh grade. All that, yeah. I, I and I I realized this maybe in the last three or four years. You know, I might have talked about this in the last time I was on the show. Um, like I'm I'm kind of obsessed with trying to bring as much of fourth grade into children's grade books as I can. too you said yeah yeah I do, I do children's books as well as uh on occasion you know not every obviously not every day but yeah i i think um i love i love reading a frog and toad story frog and toad yeah you said <laughs> have you read frederick to the kids that's one of my favorites <laughs> no which one's that frederick by leo leone just go get it and read it to your students and have okay. them narrate it backwards with all the details. Just okay. say to them, after I'm done reading it, you guys are going to narrate this in sequence. Okay. Read it. And then when you're all done, say, okay, close your eyes and think about the sequence, what happened in the story. Uh-huh. Okay. And now we're going to narrate the whole story from the end to the beginning. This is what Quintilli Qu Quintilian did this. Ooh, I like it. With his rhetoric students to help okay. them organize their thoughts. To the That's skill of organizing great. their thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I do that one at teacher trainings and hopefully anybody who's listening doesn't go cheat and read it <laughs> <laughs> no, knowing they're going to come to one of my training sessions. Cause I'm going to probably do this one. It's something they attend. <laughs> That's one of my favorites, but any, any story that like, like Frederick that has a really great sequence, it's a picture book. It's like a okay. kindergarten book. <laughs> You're going to love it. <laughs> 
Sounds great. I'll take a look at it. Yeah, but yeah, this is practical. And I, I like, so what you're doing when you read it and then you stop and ask these questions, is you're just, you are doing what David, David, the essence of David Hicks' book says is to create a spirit of inquiry. Yes. That a classical education at its heart is to is creating a spirit of inquiry. Yes. It's strengthening minds to a classical education strengthens a mind so that you can ask this most fundamental human question, which is um, what's underneath the surface? Is what's the reality behind the appearance? Um and I think that a healthy mind always wants to dig. Uh, a mind that's weak always trusts appearances. But a healthy mind wants to dig. And um, the, one of the great goals of a classical education is to strengthen a mind so that it has the power to dig, so that it can, it can get beyond appearances um, and see down into reality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is great. This has been an amazing conversation. I'm really excited. I'm happy that we just did this unplanned and candidly. It was yes, really lovely. I, I agreed. <laughs> yes, it was nice. We we set this up like what two days ago. It was yeah, it was, yeah. yeah I love and it. All I knew this was we were going to talk about practical. And I want our listeners to uh, know where to find your uh, pamphlet, a short introduction to classical Christian education. And I am now yes. going to feature you on my website, beautifulteaching.com. So there will be a link to your materials through my site. But tell 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 our listeners really how they can access that. Uh, yeah, you can you can find all of my stuff. You can find uh, links to purchase. So your parents are thinking of sending you to a classical Christian school and a short introduction to classical Christian education on my website, which is gibbsclassical.com. And uh, the second Gibbs Classical Online Summer Conference is next month, June 23rd and 24th. You can find out more about that on gibbsclassical.com. And you can sign up for the mailing list. And I do free webinars every now and again. So, yeah, head over to gibbsclassical.com. And you'll be having courses this fall as well? Yes, fall and yeah. spring. Haven't announced those yet. Um, but if you sign up on the mailing list, you'll be first to know whenever those are announced. All right, perfect. Thank you, Josh. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for listening. You can get involved in a few ways. There's a Facebook page where we actively discuss the ideas around classical education. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. And if you want to help offset our production costs, you can support the podcast financially by going to www.classicaleducationpodcast.com forward slash support. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once said, well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be in a few words this. They will know what it is to see the sky they will know what it is to breathe it, and they will know best of all what it is to behave under it as in the presence of a Father who is in heaven.